is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Vorkosigan Sabga, book two ish, Brary R, chapters 10, 11, and 12. In these chapters, our friends get attacked. This is honestly like, I feel like I should have seen it coming that we were heading in this direction. I didn't. And I really don't like everybody being separated at all. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Thank you very much to Jeff for commissioning this episode. And thank you to Jeff for flexibility and again, having to reschedule. I just didn't have a lot of health problems this year, guys. But uh, I I fucked up my back. It's in spasm. And so I had to cancel Tuesday and reschedule to Thursday. Thankfully, it's feeling much better today. But I am standing for this recording because it's it's better for my back. And uh, so if you hear lots of weird noises and shuffling and stuff... It's probably because I'm like shifting position a lot more than I tend to do when I'm in my chair. Um, And also, if you uh, hear some weird bleating sounds, my neighbors have gotten themselves a pair of baby goats, which, yes, are as adorable as they sound. And they're loud. (laughs) So, yeah, they are. uh, I don't know if they're coming through on the mic, but I can definitely hear them when I record. So. Um, and also thirdly, I, my second recording today, I started like losing my voice. So this is my third one and it's still like mostly here, but I think you can hear like, it sounds weird. So guys, I don't know what's happening, but it really feels like my body needs some sort of reboot. Like, you know, there's just a lot of bugs in the system. Something went wrong somewhere. And now I think I need to do a sort of, uh, basic factory reset. I don't know, something like that. Um, Anyway, okay, okay. So let's begin with chapter 10, which starts off so nice, right before everything goes so wrong. Cordelia wakes up and she's in this comfy bed and she's finally gotten to take off the thing that's got like oxygen in it. I'm imagining it as like a CPAP machine, which I love my CPAP machine, guys. Like, I, for me, it's super comfortable. I have the one that just goes over my nose. I can't sleep without that thing anymore, man. It is the best. If you don't have one and you have been having some, like, very not great days where you're feeling super foggy and you also know you've put weight on, those things may correlate and you may want to look into it. But, um, it's just like such a comfy beginning. She's so relaxed after everything, you know, and it's feeling good. And then in comes Drew. And there's a whole lot of like little questions about her pregnancy and how she knew. And I immediately started to be like, hmm, this sounds like she. And finally, Cordelia realizes and she's like, wait a second. Do you have a personal reason for asking this? And she says, yes. And when Cordelia says, do you want to talk about it? She says, no, I don't know. I presume that means yes, Cordelia sighed. Yeah, honestly, if somebody says no, I don't know. To me, that means yes. Yeah, I agree. I want to back up a tiny bit and mention her Cordelia saying that at home, she couldn't have had her contraceptive implant removed without buying a license. It's a bait and legal requirement. You have to qualify for a parent's license first. I've had my implant since I was 14. I had a menstrual period once then, I remember. We turn them off till they're needed. I got my implant and my hymen cut and my ears pierced and had my coming out party. What? <laughs> This actually was really funny to me because even though I know that it's like the, the, you know, reproductive implant, contraceptive implant, I should say, 
when she says, I got my implant and my hymen cut altogether, it just sounds very sinister, really. You know, if you had it out of context. Um, but I do like the idea of like ear piercing as part of the same ritual. Show of hands, anybody listening, especially AFAB uh, women, were you eventually allowed to pierce your ears or did you have your ears pierced when you were still young enough that they didn't get permission from you or anything they just did it because I got my ears pierced as a baby an infant and I'll tell you I infinitely prefer that (laughs) I was so glad that I didn't have to go through the whole thing with my ear piercing when I was older I had friends who were like um you know I'm going to go get my ears pierced and it was a big deal and I just felt bad for them that they had to like bother with doing that now when the pain was going to be something they had to deal with and the cleaning I got that shit all done for me it was great I didn't have to like you know it's it's also like very much a hispanic thing all the female babies are always ear pierced and they're given like lacy headbands to wear we have to be as feminine presenting as is humanly possible for an infant child so yeah i think if it were not frowned upon to give us lipstick they probably would do that too but it was part of the thing with my dad you know so uh just an interesting and 14 says you didn't start doing sex when you were 14 did you i did drew and i don't regret any of it um vicky says i was five and begged to get them pierced i'm also latina and i'm somewhat surprised they didn't do it when i was an infant probably only because that's on my dad's side interesting kate says it was allowed once i hit 15 that's so late there's so much great stuff that you need earrings for before 15. Come on, parents. Jeez, it's not that big a deal. Like, what? what's, what's the big deal? Like, I'm genuinely asking. You put a little snip in your ear and you wear jewelry on it. Fucking who cares? Like, I don't know. It's, it's weirdly like, it feels like we have attached some sort of sexualized meaning to it that... I can't understand because having had it since I was an infant, that just doesn't, I don't relate to that. So I don't, I don't really get it. But uh, anyway, we find out that Drew and Koo had sex and he has been avoiding her ever since. And I was genuinely like, Koo, what the fuck? Like, I never expected it to be what it winds up being but I was so angry at him already for just avoiding her um I love that Cordelia is very eager to give her stamp of approval on this thing and uh eventually offers Drew one of her little blue dots that she can pee on to find out if she's pregnant and she gets a negative result and seems really like bummed about it and when cordelia's like wait i can't tell are you glad or are you sad about it and she says i don't know i guess i just thought maybe he might be as happy about the baby as he was about the sex uh i didn't want to be pregnant it would destroy me and i was like oh god it probably would too um but it, they get interrupted here by Errol, who happens to have Kudelka with him. And Kudelka comes in and says, I came to turn myself in, Mr. Shnikovi, and to apologize. No, that sounds trivial. And believe me, I don't think it trivial. You deserve more than apology. I owe you expiation, whatever you want. But I'm so, so sorry I raped you. (laughs) Good God. For fuck's 
sake, dude. What are you do- – how do you fuck this up like this? Like, that is so- – oh, my God. I loved how concise the explanation is that Cordelia gives him later. But first, let's deal with Drew's, Drew's reaction. You think – you – what? You think you could – oh, Coo, you oaf, you idiot, you moron, you, you, you. Her words sputtered off. Her whole body was shaking. Cordelia watched in utter fascination. Errol rubbed his lips thoughtfully. Trishnikofi stalked over to Kudelka and kicked his sword stick out of his hand. He almost fell with a startled, huh? Clutching at it and missing as it clattered to the floor. Drew slammed him expertly into the wall and paralyzed him with a nerve thrust, her fingers jammed up into his solar plexus. His breath stopped. You goon. Do you think you could lay a hand on me without my permission? Ah, oh, to be so... To be so... 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 Her baffled words dissolved into a scream of outrage right next to his ear. He spasmed. Please don't break my secretary, Drew. The repairs are expensive, said Errol mildly. Ugh! She whirled away, releasing Kudelka. He staggered and fell to his knees. Hands over her face, biting her fingers, she stomped out the door, slamming it behind her. (sighs) First of all, How many people were listening to her, like, disable and slam him against a wall going, okay, mom, yeah. (laughs) Yes, mother. I mean, my God. I just, like, this is, I feel like a lot of fanfic was born, probably, from that little moment. (laughs) Oh, God bless her. Especially her being, like, a tall Amazonian. I... The, the, I, I'm tempted to read all the dialogue in this scene because it's so good, but I'm just going to jump to. <laughs> so first she says, you insulted her coup, not then, but right now in this room and not just in slighting her combat prowess. What you just said revealed to her for the first time that you were so intent on yourself that night, you never saw her at all. Bad, Koo, very bad. You owe her a profound apology. Here she was giving her Barry R and all to you, and you so little appreciated what she was doing, you didn't even perceive it. His head came up suddenly. Gave me? Like some charity? gift of the gods more like murmured errol lost in some appreciation of his own (laughs) i'm sorry but that line is so good and then i'm not a kudelka's head swiveled toward the door are you saying i should run after her crawl actually if i were you recommended errol crawl fast Slither under her door, go belly up, let her stomp on you till she gets it out of her system. Then apologize some more. You may yet save the situation. What do you call that? Total surrender? No. I'd call it winning. (laughs) Oh my god, you guys. I love this so much. I love it so much, Errol, just being like, yeah, lay down and let her walk on you and enjoy that shit. Are you stupid? Go. What is the matter with you? I just, I can't. I love it so much. <laughs> you're, my lady, you're laughing at me. Stop. Then stop making yourself ridiculous, said Cordelia sharply. Get your head out of your ass. Think for 60 consecutive seconds about somebody besides yourself. And he is just like, how dare you? And he leaves. Her and her husband have to giggle a little bit more. And then she says, 
His remorse was sincere, but a trifle smug. I think we may have coddled his self-doubts long enough. It may be time to kick his tail. That was an interesting, like, observation. That, like, yeah, he apparently really felt sad about it, but also might have been kind of patting himself on the back over it. Which is like a real fucked up way to approach that. Like, ew, you know? Um, anyway, so this is the really ugly scene where she is about to have something to eat with Errol and the Count isn't there. And they're like, weird, where'd he go? And it turns out he did go down to Mill. Imp mill. It's really hard for me to say that because it just sounds like something from a fantasy book where imps are being created like in, in the pits for the, what do you, what, what, what are the, you know, the ones guys from Lord of the Rings? It sounds like that. Um, but the Count comes back and he is so pissed. And I adore uh, Adored this argument because it's basically the count being a real piece of shit about one issue after another as his son counters him with the exact tactics he himself taught his son. And it becomes apparent to him that he has pushed things too far, that he is beginning to like look like he's ridiculous, but he's gotten too far into the argument to like let it go. And you guys, I've got to admit, I'm somebody who loves to argue. That's part of what makes the show work is that I always have another point to make. I always have something that I want to like to point out and I will argue with myself over whether something is, is what it seems to be or not. I can see both sides like a real fucking Libra and argue from either direction just because I want to be, make sure that the argument I actually agree with doesn't have holes in it that the other side can easily jump on. However, I don't remember Having, and I'm not saying this doesn't happen at all, but I don't remember personally getting into an argument with somebody and realizing partway through that I had it fucked up and continuing anyway. I don't know that that's ever happened to me. I have definitely had arguments where halfway through I realize I fucked up, but when I realize that everything comes to a screeching halt and I'm like, Oh, wait, what? And I just, I think that's because I do the thing where I argue from the opposite side so much that if in the midst of a, a conversation, I'm able to see, then my side of the argument, I can't continue to defend it effectively because I see the hole in it myself and there's no point. Do you know what I'm saying? So the, the way that this goes, it's so well written. Again, you guys, this book is so well written and the, the dialogue is just chef's kiss. So good. But he tries to, first of all, claim he was entrapped. <laughs> and Errol is very rightfully like, um, if you had minded your own business and not gone over there, there would have been no trap for you to fall into, sir. That sounds like a you problem. And he then... I shouldn't have to be doing this. It's women's work guarding our genome. Errol says was women's work in the time of isolation when the only answer to mutation was infanticide. Now there are other answers. Cordelia, just out loud. I love her. She's like not really engaged with this argument like she is, but she just, how strange women must have felt about their pregnancies, never knowing if there was life or death at the end of them, Cordelia mused. <laughs> you fail all of us when you fail to control her. How do you imagine you can run a planet when you cannot run your own household? One corner of Errol's mouth twisted up slightly. 
Indeed, she is difficult to control. She escaped me twice. Her voluntary return still astounds me. So then, then, the Count tries to be like, Do you choose to obey this off-worlder woman before me? Yes. <sighs> His voice fell to a whisper. That is the proper order of things. You guys... Never settle for a man who won't say yes to that. It's just a requirement. And it's like, I would say 80% of the questions under Reddit's, am I an asshole? Or am I the asshole in this situation? Are people who took the side of a brother or a mother or father over their spouse. And... All of them, like th there's very, very few exceptions, unless your spouse is being like actively abusive to somebody in which I support you d like siding with somebody from your original birth family over your spouse. It, I'm not saying it never happens, but it's pretty rare and I don't understand it. It's something that for me, it would be like a simply a no brainer if there was some sort of argument or misunderstanding or something between Owen and like my mother and my stepdad. I absolutely would be like going home with Owen and, and talking to him about it. And I wouldn't ever, you know, there was a wild, am I the asshole about this woman who's uh, who got pregnant, she was his actual wife. They were married and she had had a baby about two months earlier. And apparently her mother-in-law had started getting really fucking mean and was like just calling her all kinds of names and saying how she like didn't belong in the family. She had been kind up until a pregnancy and then she started to weirdly turn on her. And eventually there's like a meal with the whole family and his wife goes to breastfeed to come back and eat after so he puts some food for her in the refrigerator for when she's done he goes outside and then hears a commotion and he comes back in to find his mother giving away his wife's food to their little cousin and when his wife comes in and i don't know if you guys are aware that like breastfeeding you use up a lot of calories so you got to be eating but when his wife came in and saw that her food was being handed to somebody else, who it was that woman's third serving, by the way, her, her mother-in-law said, you look like you could stand to skip a few meals and slapped her really hard on the stomach. And this man told everybody to get out of his house and they did, except for his wife. And he looked at her and said, you too. And made his wife take their infant child and find somewhere else to stay for the night. And genuinely thought that was like a reasonable thing to do. And was like, I just needed some space and time to think everything over. And when he tried to get in touch with his wife, being like, you know, come back, she said no. And filed for divorce. And I, that was the happiest ending to a, an am I the asshole I have ever seen. Because she was like, your mother has been a monster to me all through this pregnancy and you have never done shit. And then she literally slaps me. And the wife, I think, punched the, the mother-in-law in response to the slap. And he, all he like wanted to talk about was you punched my mom. And she's like, she slapped me on the spot where I gave birth two months ago after months of terrorizing me. So yeah, I punched her and I'm not sorry. And he just didn't want to see it. And he was just like, it wasn't until everybody was like, yeah, you're the asshole. What is the matter with you? That he really seemed to see it. I'm so sorry for going off on this huge tangent, you guys. But like, it's just, a, it's shocking to me. It really is. People who are like willing to marry a person, but not have their back in any significant way, which in my opinion is like part of the job. That's the point. You know, you marry somebody to have them on your side and not blindly, 
but like, come on, you know? So then he says, attempt, this is Errol, attempting to switch the issue from infanticide to obedience will not help you, sir. You taught me specious rhetoric chopping yourself. I really want to remember that. Specious rhetoric chopping? That's good. I really want to remember that. <laughs> and let's see, Kudelka interrupts here and says, I'm having trouble with the comm console. It's down again, which in the moment just feels like a weird interruption. But later on, we find out how significant this is. And then when we return to the argument, the count says, I'll disown it, that thing in the can. Just like the ableism here is just so incredibly upsetting. Um, not an operative threat, sir. You can disown me by an imperial order, which you would have to humbly pe petition uh, me for. His edged smile gleamed. I would, of course, grant it to you. <sighs> Ooh, rough. And then he does, we cannot carry the dead weight of millions of dysfunctionals millions now you extrapolate from one to infinity a weak argument sir unworthy of you and surely said cordelia quietly how much is bearable each individual carrying his or her own burden must decide yes and who's paying for all this the imperium vegan's laboratory is budgeted under military research all barriar is paying for prolonging the life of your monster ew that's such a gross approach. It's so gross. She just says, perhaps it'll be a better investment than you think. And I think she's right. If they're able to figure this out, then the medical technology here should start to improve once they've gotten the hang of this. But like, ew, that, that argument is just really like petty feeling, you know? And then he says, I don't want my name in, on that thing. He keeps saying thing. It's so wild to me that he is just so certain that this child is going to come out mutated somehow. At least wait to have this fight until you know for sure. What's the point of this right now? You know? Um, and he says, very well, sir. Call him Miles Naismith Borkosigan then, said Cordelia, feigning calm over a sick and trembling belly. My father will not begrudge it. Your father is dead, snapped Piotr. Not wholly. Not while I live and remember. Piotr looked at her as if she'd just hit him in his Barry Aaron stomach. Barry Aaron's ceremonies for the dead approached ancestor worship, as if remembrance could keep the souls alive. Did his own mortality run chill in his veins today? And yeah, maybe like pointing out what if there's nobody that wants to remember you because you've abandoned them? Hmm, interesting. So then he says, all right, fine. I want you guys to get out. Both houses. And Errol just says, all right. You throw away your home for this? My home is not a place. It's a person, sir, Errol said gravely, then added reluctantly, people, meaning Piotr as well as Cordelia. Even now, Errol offered him gestures of courtesy that nearly stopped her heart. You will return your rents and revenues to the district purse, said Piotr desperately. As you wish, sir. Piotr's voice went smaller. Where will you live? Sir. Oh, my God. <sighs> I'm just... Mm. At this point, Cordelia is like, um, what's going on with that light flyer? Something's weird about it. It's not, it's not full of bombs, right? And they both turn and look and it has insect markings and they run outside and it's Captain Negri with the prince and they find out that there is a coup happening. HQ surrounded. Why didn't you respond? Uh, fighting at the Imperial residence, we were on to him, about to arrest. He panicked, struck too soon. I think he has Kareen. It's Vordarian. 
Now, guys, please help me because I I don't – everybody's name starting with Vor gets really difficult for me to, like, remember who is who. Is Vordarian the one that she was talking to at the party who tried to out uh, – like – or was he the one that both of the sons were killed? I don't. I don't remember which is which. Um, I should probably like get like a little chart. Make make <laughs> with just like some character notes there. Um, and they find out that like the. Uh, the console, com console was sabotaged and there's one dude who like tries to say that Drew went in after him and I was just like, oh, come now, sir. I mean, they even have like fast penta, which is that truth drug. So I don't know why you'd bother lying because that shit's not going to hold up for very long. Um, Vicky says he's the one from the party that outed Errol. Okay. And they believe that he has Kareen as well, which, uh, you know, he was making a play for her and now he's just decided to put all his fucking cards on the table. Like, yes. Um, so the way that this is handled is that they're going to set up a, a few little like distractions. They take the light flyer and they put Negri's body in it and they crash it into the lake. And that is going to be plenty of work for them to find and dredge up and find the body. And then wonder is the prince here too and dredge and dredge. And even if they don't find the body, they're not going to be totally sure that he's still alive. And they, they it's just like a series of throwing them off the scent. There's also like official... Uh, vehicles that they're like oh drive them in this direction and that direction because they would think that they just you know took off but what they actually are going to do is on foot at least her and the count um and errol says i didn't want to worry you with it when you were so sick we'd found vordarium was conspiring at hq and elsewhere ilian's investigation was inspired top security people must have that sort of intuition i suppose <clears throat> i don't know about that guys i feel like there's been a couple little things that have made me sort of side eye ilian i don't i really don't know what to think about that like am i being paranoid his investigation was inspired and that intuition it feels for me like vordarian was maybe framed for this like the thing is we know that he's a shit and we know he's been like trying to pull some stuff but does that mean that he tried for a coup or does that mean that he is the perfect person to frame for the coup? You know what I'm saying, guys? Like, I don't know. I don't know. This feels sus for me. I'm anyway, I'm just going to put a pin in that. I just wanted to mention it because that really like the mention of intuition was what got me because that feels like a word that doesn't get used around here that much. You know, Barry Arons, they are a very, like, logic-driven, left-brain sort of group. I just don't, I don't, I don't know. So, anyway, um, Kate says, she suggested it sounds like he took credit for her good idea says Kate. Wait, I, I think I might have talked past when you what you were pointing out. I'm sorry, Kate. Ref, uh, refresh me on what you were referring to there. Um, so, let's see. As uh, How far, my lord? As far as your ingenuity can take you. Then escape if you can and rejoin my lord regent. Hmm? The man nodded and galloped off like Esther Hazy. So, uh, sounds like he took credit for her good idea after the party. 
I'm sorry. Not following you, Kate. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm sure once you say it, I'm going to be like, oh, doy. But um, let's see. So Negri called me last night with a word he had his evidence in hand enough to move on uh, to move on at last. He needed an imperial order for me to arrest a ruling district count. I was supposed to go up to Vorbar Sultana tonight and oversee the operation. Clearly, Vordarian was warned. His original move wasn't planned for another month, preferably right after my successful assassination. So what I'm thinking might be happening here. Um, oh, okay. Vicky is saying R.E. Kate's comment. After the party, Cordelia suggested Vordarian should go from the short list to the top of the list. Oh, oh, I see what you're saying, Kate. So like, he's trying to act like it's intuition, but Cordelia fucking said. So why is he giving that credit to Ilian when it's actually her that mentioned him? Okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah, actually, that's a good point. Mm. mm, It's a what came first situation, right? Because like, if she noticed it because Ilium was already on his tail a little bit, then why would Errol argue with her about it? But if she noticed it before Ilium did, and Ilium is crooked, then maybe he heard that you know already errol doesn't think well of this guy and has his eye on him so perfect i'll use him it all depends on that timing i think um and also like what i i could see having happened if he has been framed and i don't know if this is the kind of story where that happens you know what i'm saying like how intricate does the plot get with this stuff? It feels like pretty intricate to me. Just the, the, the last book was a pretty straightforward series of events. There were certainly like nuance and everything in there, but people were pretty much what they seemed to be mostly. So I'm kind of going based off of that, but a lot of the time, when you have an ongoing series, that's the way things start. And that's just us getting our feet on the ground and then preparing to begin more complicated storylines. So I really don't know. And if, if Vortarian is being framed, maybe he like lashed out, not because he jumped the gun for the coup that he was planning, but because he began to see, oh my God, I'm being framed. Like he found a bunch of money had been transported into his bank account or, you know, something that was going to really like, it was very clear. I am seconds away from getting fucking nailed for this. I don't really know if that, because like, again, the fact that they have this truth drug That keeps sort of throwing a wrench in the works for me, where if he were innocent and they gave him that drug and he didn't confess to anything and insisted, then they would know if that drug is reliable that he wasn't involved. But I also don't know if there's maybe like, are there laws to keep that from being used on vores or are vores given little scoops of that stuff in their porridge every day until they're immune to it like you know i don't know what the fuck the thing is here so that truth drug does kind of make it feel like lying and deceit aren't going to be super helpful if you actually get caught um so if you were being framed letting yourself get caught would maybe be more helpful than anything i don't know i don't know i don't know anyway okay so, uh, the, the, it's so sad. Cordelia asks Prince Gregor, like, do you, did you see what happened to your mother? And eventually he tells her the story and the way that they came and grabbed her. They tried to grab him and he got saved and all his mother held on to was his shoe. Um, and yeah, I really like the part when he's like, Negri kept telling me to be quiet, but I was, because <laughs> I believe him. I'm sure Negri was just trying to like remind him, but I, uh, I believe that a lot of times when children are told to be quiet by adults who are scared, that shit sinks in, in a way that 
you know, if they are in control of themselves, like beyond a certain age, there are so many games and stuff that you play as kids where it has to be like freeze or, you know, staring contests or whatever, that something becomes this serious and you feel other adults in the room are threatened also. Yeah, you could be pretty fucking quiet, you know? So they have to ditch all of their gear that contains any sort of link, uh, comm link. And the, I was immediately thinking about my Apple watch and how I would have to ditch that and my phone. What a bummer, man. There are some things that I just really think back to like, I know that I didn't always have this device, but I can't remember it. I can't remember those times. You know what I mean? Like, I just truly, ah, uh, what a bummer. So they wind up having to take horses. And poor Cordelia. I just thought this line was so funny. Metal bars in their mouths, the Barry Arons called bits. Cordelia thought it a very small control surface for such a large piece of transport. What a way to phrase that. God, that cracked me up. Um, so <laughs> then she has to get up there and apparently the girth wasn't tightened enough and she's already freaking out because she's never rode a horse and horses are a little bit scary and intimidating to her. And <laughs> the brown fur covered skin of its shoulder shuddered suddenly. Oh God, they've given me a defective one. It's going into convulsions. <laughs> So she tries to put her foot in the stirrup and it just turns the saddle until it's under the horse and she just falls down. I'm so sorry. I know we are in an emergency situation, but that is so fucking hilarious. She's so competent all the time, you know, that for her to just have this moment of just like, oh, what is this? I, it was just very enjoyable. I liked this part a whole lot. Um, <laughs> and then when he says, haven't you ever ridden before? And she says, never. He says, don't tell me you've never ridden a stride. His teeth bared. Just pretend it's my son. <laughs> yes. Such a petty little bitch. I swear to God. I can't, like, I'm not, I'm not even, like, mad. Like, he sucks. But also, he's smart enough to make his sucking kind of fun in a weird way. Does, does that make sense? Oh, God. That's, that's, that's amazing. So, she hops on and they have to go into a straight up can canter right away. And her poor scar, like she is having some pain, just trying to hold it together. Like clearly she knows I have got to give this my all because our lives are on the line. But like as they're going, <laughs> eventually Bothari turns around and sees her just like, you know, pale and trembling and kind of sick to her stomach. And he's like, uh, you're going too fast for her. And Piotr says she'd be a lot sicker if they'd take us. And she's like, I'll manage. Just give me a minute. So they see like the flyers land and she realizes that everybody who's on their side has the same uniform on as the people trying to take them down. And she's just like, oh, this is going to be really messy. I don't like this. Um, so there's Cordelia asks, won't they be able to tell when they count the horses missing from the stable where we've gone and how? And Esther Hazy says, I let them all out. And uh, Piotr is like, yeah, but most of them are just going to hang around because that's where their food is. Which, if you all have pets that get out of the house, there are two different kinds. Pets that just book it as fast and far from your front door as they can get. And then there are the ones that get outside your front door and cower up against the like door jam outside looking around. That's what our cats are like. They get outside and they just sit there like, oh, God. Oh, God, I'm outside. What now? Why am I here? What did I do this for? Um, so <laughs> Cordelia is like, where are they going down to the villages for? Like, what do they want there? 
Us, my lady, said Esther Hazy grimly. Us armsmen, our families, they're on a hostage hunt down there. Esther Hazy had a wife and two children in the capital, Cordelia recalled. And what was happening to them right now? Had anyone passed them a warning? Esther Hazy looked as though he was wondering that, too. I really appreciated the discussions about how this is probably going for the... What do you call people participating in a coup? Usurpers? I, I feel like usurper is the title for the person in charge. But what about the people who are working for the usurper? Would they be, just be rebels? I'm so used to associating the word rebels with like people who are fighting for justice against an unjust system that I hesitate to use that word here. But I feel like that's the only way to talk about them. Um, but Errol, or not Errol, um, the Count at some point is talking about the way this is probably going down there. Um, Vordarian must divert a part of his surely finite loyal troops to hold Hasadar, which is the capital, um, deep in a hostile territory with a long guerrilla tradition. We'll get good intelligence out of everything they do there, but the population will be opaque to them. And it's my capital. He occupies a count's district capital with imperial troops. All my brother counts must pause and think about that one. Am I next? Arrow probably went on to Tannery Base Shuttleport. He must open an independent line of communication with the space-based forces if Vordarian has truly choked off Imperial headquarters. The spacer's choice of loyalties will be critical. I predict... A severe outbreak of technical difficulties in their calm rooms while the ship commanders scramble to figure out which is going to be the winning side. My God, that is so cynical. I don't mean his like prediction. I mean that situation. God. So... She says, does it ta the capital have great strategic value? And he says, in some wars it would, but not this one. This is a war for loyalty, not territory. Vorbara Sultana is a communication center, though. And communication is much, but not the only center. What he holds right now, unless I miss my guess, is a very large building full of chaos. I doubt a quarter of the men are at their posts, and half of them are plotting sabotage to benefit whatever side they secretly favor. The rest are out running for cover or trying to get their families out of town. I just love all of that, like, really emphasizing that these guys are people with their own lives and their own thoughts, because so often in these sorts of situations in fiction, you've just got, like, everybody who's in the the army of the opposing side are all loyal to that army except for like one guy who you can bribe and get to do what you want but everybody else they believe in the cause or they believe in the leader or whatever and i really love that it's so like up in the air and there's such a a, a sort of attitude of practicality about it because these people have their own families that they care about that they are going to have to like either just trust somebody is looking out for or take the matters into their own hands and that they don't necessarily trust that shit's being taken care of and why would they because they are seen as soldiers first i would imagine um it's just like a, an, an interesting detail that makes all of the people involved in this feel like they are all individually whole people. And I really like that. Um, so let's see. Uh, so they talk about then showing up on thermal sensors. And because Cordelia is like, you know, we ditched all of our con stuff, but we'll show up. The horses will show up. And he's like, oh, yeah, they'll all show up. And so will all the other people and all of the other like cows and goats and deer and horses and all their kids there's going to be a lot for them to sift through they may still be able to track us and probably we should split up soon but i think that we are in a pretty decent position for right now so they are continuing on cordelia is thinking a lot about how much worse this would be if she were still pregnant 
So she's just like, oh, God. I mean, she can't help but think later about what they could be doing to the container that her son is in. But for the moment, she has pushed that out of her mind. And uh, eventually, they reach this this person, um, Amy Pass Road, milady. This is a road? Cordelia muttered in dismay, staring up and down it. Piotr stood a little way off, with another older man holding the reins of a sturdy little black-and-white horse. The horse was considerably better groomed than the old man. I did think that was funny. And I kind of, you guys, I don't want to think this, and I don't really, I don't really think this. But the dudes that overtake them at the tunnels, this guy was not with them anymore when those dudes showed up. And I'm just really worried that he, like, isn't quite as loyal as he looked like he was. I don't, like I said, I don't want to believe that. I really don't. So I'm going to try and, like, hold my horses on that. But it felt it felt like the timing was very suspicious. Um, but, yeah, this guy, uh, he, <laughs> he sees the prince and he just, like, s- says, so that's him, huh? Hmm. Huh. Not much. Might do in time, asserted Piotr, if he gets time. Um, so they get some rations off of him. And uh, also... There's some maple maple sugar. Guys, I love me some maple sugar. I'll tell you what. If any of you are living in a place that sells like maple candy, like Vermont is like the place for it, but there's a lot of places in Connecticut you can find it too. Those little maple candies where they're like pressed into leaf shapes. Oh, that shit is my jam. I love it so much. I can only take like a little bit at a time because it's so intensely sweet. But the depth of like the bitter aspect that that maple brings to it, Oh, it's so good. Anyway, um, so Piotr waited for Esther Hazy to give him a leg up on his horse. He settled into his saddle with a sigh, his back temporarily curved in an uncharacteristic slump. Damn, but I'm getting old for this sort of thing. Um, and he takes some uh, gum leaf, which is a stimulant. And later on, Cordelia tries some of this, too, because she is really starting to flag. Take care of my lord's horses, called Esther Hazy rather desperately to Bathari. They're not machines, remember. I appreciate Esther Hazy's concern about the horses. Somebody needs to care about the horses. You know, we need this. So then we go into chapter 12. Um, and the major put Gregor comfortably padded by the bedroll and saddlebags up behind him. Cordelia faced one more climb onto that torture device for humans and horses called a saddle. So, said the old man after a time, you're the new Lady Vorkosigan. Ah, yes. Piotr didn't mention your name, Major. Amor... Ooh, how do you say this, guys? Klyuvi? Klyuvi? But he says to just call himself Cly, so that's fine. I I don't remember how he says this in the the audiobook, because I listened to the audiobook. It's quite good. I was a little bit, like, taken aback that a book series with such a a feminine centric viewpoint with the protagonist was narrated by a guy, but I also don't know how later books are and if they just kept the same, you know, or, but he does quite a good job, I think actually. Um, So he, it turns out is the mailman and he has been doing this for a really long time. He is hoping that he'll be a triple 20 years service man. Damn, that's a long ass time. And when she asks what branch of the military he is from, he says Imperial Rangers. He watched slyly for her reaction. She rewarded him with impressed raised brows. I was a throat cutter, not a tech. That's why I could never go higher than major. Got my start at age 14 in these mountains, running things around the seat of Gandons with the general and his R. Never did get back to school after that, just training courses. The service, is, the service passed me by in time. Did Piotr tell you what happened yesterday afternoon? I left the lake day before yesterday morning, missed all the excitement. I expect the news will catch up with me before noon. And he says, finally, 
Hey, um, by the way, I don't know if you remember, but you're wearing a jacket with the name Vorkosigan, comma, A in giant block letters on it. What do you say we do something about that? <laughs> so he goes off to deliver some stuff, comes back, and he has a big skirt for her to pull over her pants. He's got a oversized, like, button-up for the kid to put on over his little uniform. Um, and... The, the overall look of them is like very drab, but they definitely fit in, it feels like. Um, and he asks her about the miscarriage and she's like, not a miscarriage. She's still alive and we're still working on it. Um, and he says, no one will bother the hospital, said Cly, watching her face. I, yes, right. Why did you come to bury our off-worlder? I wanted to have children. A humorless laugh puffed from her lips. Do you have any children, Cly the male? Not so far as I know. You were very wise. Oh, I don't know. Since my old woman died, it's been pretty quiet. Some men I know their children have been a great trouble to them. Ezar, Piotr. Don't know who will burn the offerings on my grave. Menis, maybe. I kind of liked that. The just sort of like... You know, I don't regret it necessarily, but sometimes I do think about it. And then I see these guys with their kids and I'm like, maybe I dodged a bullet. Uh, who can tell? Um, so eventually, and I do like to, anytime they pass people, she starts to be like, are they, are they going to know who we are? Are they going to betray us? Are they going to tell anybody? And she just, it's really hard for her to like relax at all. And it's really starting to eat at her, you know? Um, Cly eventually says, this place is just too crowded. <laughs> he says this, gazing up and down the silent, shadowed wilderness trail. And when he says this, it was a measure of Cordelia's overstrain that she found herself mentally agreeing with him. Think you can go on for another four hours, milady? That depends on what's at the end of four more hours of this. My place. I usually spend this night at my niece's near here. My route ends about another ten hours farther on while I'm making my deliveries, but if we go straight up, we can do it in four. I can double back to this point by tomorrow morning and keep my schedule as usual, real quiet-like. And it takes six hours, because Bothari's horse goes lame. He dismounted and towed it. It limped and tossed its head. Aw, the poor little thing. Has to keep going with his lame foot or whatever happened to it. Gregor fell asleep and fell off, cried for his mother, fell asleep again. The last climb stole Cordelia's breath and made her heart race, even though she hung on to Rose's stirrup for help. Both horses moved like old women with arthritis, stumping along jerkily. Only the animal's innate gregariousness kept them following Cly's hardy pinto. I really felt like everybody in the situation, they know what's going on, but the horses don't know. They don't understand, you know. So anytime that you've got animals involved who are being made to do something that is hurting them, even though, you know, it's probably for their own good ultimately as well. It's just hard to read. It's how I am like with taking care of Pippin. I have to do stuff that hurts him sometimes in order to keep him safe and healthy and I just, it breaks my heart every single time, even though I know, and I have to chant to myself, like, you'll be glad you did this. You'll be glad you did this, but it's hard to keep that in mind. So eventually she falls asleep in that shack and, uh, she wakes up and they've actually got like some food here and there's, I think some herb tea as well, um, and let's see, why don't you take over the bed, Sergeant? I'll keep watch. Did Cly have any suggestions what we should do? Not quite, milady. There's a set of caves up in that patch of woods in the back, an old gorilla cache. Cly took me back last night to see the entrance. So she sits and is just sort of keeping a watch on things. There's a point at which she can see their home, or at least the lake, I think, in front of it. And she's just like, wow. We've really come a long way in this amount of time to be on foot. And then she's like, yeah, but God, like a flyer could cover that in about four minutes. That's really scary as well, you know? Um, so let's see. 
Cordelia and Gregor sat on the porch steps as the sun passed zenith, comfortably warm now. The only sound in the vast vale besides a breeze in the branches was Bothari's snores resonating through the cabin walls. Deciding this was as relaxed as they were likely to get, Cordelia at last dared quiz Gregor on his view, her only eyewitness report of the coup in the capital. So this is when he tells his whole story. Um, and she assures him, like, your mother's very valuable. They won't hurt her. She was crying. Yes. And uh, then she's thinking about the fucking replicator and the way it's described. The event, it ends with Miles was so little, the boots could just step on him and smash him to jam. Oof. That description, you guys, really grim. So Cordelia uh, tells Bothari to show her where that cave is. And she gets an idea and is like, let's uh, camp here tonight. And he's like, okay, you want to camp here and then leave the horses. But isn't that going to tell them all like exactly what's happened here and where we've gone? And she says they will find this. They will not know where we've gone because we're not going down into that labyrinth. We just need to make it look like we were here for a bit. And then he realizes we're just going to give them another fucking distraction that they'll fucking run around in the dark. And it's pretty great, you guys. She, uh, I'm sorry, guys, if my desk shaking is coming up on the mic. I'm just, I'm trying not to lean on it too much, but I can't help but put my arms on it a little. Um... Bathari made hot tea. They shared cold lumps of pan bread left from last night and nibbled dry fruit. And Bothari mentions that he doesn't have his medication, so it's making it difficult for him to sleep. I can feel it clearing out of my sister. Things seem sharper. And she's like, I really wonder, do his drugs actually help him manage, like, the dangerous parts of what's going on with him? Or are they just meant to keep his memories from coming up because that's convenient for them? And, you know, there is no sh certainty on that. But she tells him, if you are having any trouble, please let me know. And he said, I'm not having any so far. It's just my sleep that it's affecting. Um, so eventually, Bothari comes up and is like, OK, it's time to go. And they get all of their stuff together. A bunch of people come around the corner. Um, Bothari is pulling the bridles off the horses, loosing them and tossing the gear on the pile with the saddles. Cordelia pulled herself up beside the cave and snatched one quick glimpse over the treetops. They took to the woods at a jog, Bothari boosting up and carrying Gregor piggyback. Rose made to follow them, and Cordelia whirled her to wave her arms and whisper frantically, No, go away, idiot beast! Their run was steady, unpanicked. Bothari had his route all picked out, taking advantage of sheltering rocks and trees and water-carved steps. Over here, milady, he'd found a thin horizontal crack in the rocks, half a meter high and three meters deep. No wonder the Cetagandans had trouble up here, Cordelia gasped. To pick them up, a thermal sensor would have to be aimed straight in from a point twenty meters in the air over the ravine. The place was riddled with hundreds of similar crannies. So he's got his binoculars out and he's looking around. I love when uh, she says, now we must be very quiet. And it says, pale Gregor practically went fetal because he's just so like traumatized by having been, be quiet, you know, like while they, he was being wrenched away from his mother. I really felt for the kid on that one. Um, so... They have some downtime. They sleep. They, uh, <laughs> Cordelia kept careful count of the net flow of hunters. By mid-afternoon, she calculated that some 40 men had gone below and not come up again. Two men were brought out strapped to float pallets loaded into a medical evacuation lifter and flown away. A light flyer made a bad landing in the crowded area, toppled down slope, and crunched into a tree. Yet more men became involved in extracting, writing, and repairing it. By dusk, over 60 men had been sucked down the drain. A whole company drawn away from the capital, not pursuing refugees, not available to root out the secrets of Imp Mill. It wasn't enough to make a real difference, surely. It's a start. 
And eventually, <laughs> they're down and they're near a vent and they can hear them. <laughs> God damn it. I know we went left at that third turn. That wasn't the third turn. That was the fourth. We recrossed the stream. It wasn't the same friggin' stream, Savaki. Merde, perdu. Lieutenant, you're an idiot. Corporal, you're out of line. This cold light's not going to last the hour. See, it's fading. Well, don't shake it up, you moron. When it glows brighter, it goes faster. Give me that. Bothari's teeth gleamed in the darkness. It was the first smile Cordelia had seen crack his face in months. Silently, he saluted her. They tiptoed softly away into the chill of the Dendari night. Back on the trail, Bothari sighed deeply. If only I'd had a grenade to drop down that vent, their search parties would still be shooting at each other this time next week. Oh, man, that's fun. I mean, it's fucked up. But, you know, so is stuff. So I guess we'll just... It went in Rome, as they say. Um, all right, guys, I'm going to wrap this up. I'm over time, as usual. Thank you all so much for your flexibility and rescheduling. Appreciate you a lot. And thank you for bearing with me having to stand at my desk. But I think I should be back into my regular uh, setup by next time. Fingers crossed. And thank you, Jeff, for commissioning this. Appreciate you a lot, Jeff. Until next time, toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.